morning. Welcome to the stream. I hope you're enjoying your early morning. Whatever time of day it might be, wherever you are. I'm going to be uh, baking some bagels and talking about Pied Piper of Hamelin a little bit more. I'm going to try to focus my attention on the rats and uh, on the, some of the things that I feel that they, they represent. on some of the parabolic implications. So as some of you might know, who've watched the stream before, you might know that the reason why I talk about uh, literature is because I am pursuing a career as an academic scholar. So this is just, for me, this is just uh, practice with, uh, you know, sort of musing on uh, liter literature, talking about it. My primary focus and interest uh, happens to be with, with the Victorian era. <clears throat> so poets like Robert Browning, Dante Rossetti, Christina Rossetti, uh, Elizabeth Browning. Um, uh, who else? Well, there's, so many, there's so many fantastic. Oh, uh, Emily, Dickinson, uh, Emily Dickinson, of course. She's one of my favorite poets of all time. I don't know, I, I haven't memorized many of her poems, but I do know one or two small, but like short, shorter poems. There actually is one, in fact, I should, uh, is that something I might do in the future is uh, do a Explica explication and analysis of one of her poems.
anyways, I usually begin by reciting the poem. Um, so this morning I'm not going to change the format, obviously. So I'm going to uh, recite the poem for you. And this is just an opportunity for me to, um, to it's mostly a mental exercise. Not always entirely lucid in the morning. It takes me a while to wake up. So here it goes. This is, this is Pied Piper of Hamlin by Robert Browning. Hamlin towns in Brunswick by famous Hanover City. The river Wester deep and wide washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you never spied. But when begins my ditty, almost 500 years ago, to see the town folk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles and ate the cheeses from the bats and licked the soup from the cooks on ladles. Split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests in the men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in 50 different sharps and flats. At last, the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mayor is a naughty. And as for our corporation, shocking to think we buy gowns lined with ermine for adults who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you're old and obese to find in the furry civic robes ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking to find the remedy we are lacking, or sure as fate will send you packing. At this, the mayor and corporation quake with a mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council. At length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder eyed my urban gas cell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just as he said this, what should hap? At the chamber door, but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little to wonder as fat. Nor brighter were his eyes, nor moister than a too long open oyster. Say what a new his paunch grew mutinous, for a plate of turtle green and glutinous, only a scraping of shoes on a mat. Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pit a pat. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin and light loose hair and swarthy skin, nor tuft of hair on cheek nor beard on chin, but lips were smile went out and in, there was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's as my great-grandsire, starting up at the trump of doom's tone, had walked this way from his painted tombstone. He advanced towards the council table, and please, your honor, said he, I am able, by means of secret charm to draw all the creatures living beneath the sun, they crawl or swim or fly or run after me so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper, and people call me the pie piper. And here they notice round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat of self same check. And that scarf sent on the pipe, and his fingers they notice were ever spraying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe as low it dangled over his vesture so old fangled. Yes, said he, Pied Piper as I am, in Tartari I fred the camp. Last June, his huge swarms of gnats. I eased in Asia the Nizam of a monstrous brood of vampire bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I rid your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand was the exclamation of an astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Like a musical adept, to blow his pipe his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, he heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling, great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, Brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old potters, 
gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, talking tales and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, fall to pipe hyper for their lives, from street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Wesser, where it all plunged and perished, save one who stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he the manuscript he cherished, to rap land home its commentary, which was, at first shrill notes up the pipe, I heard a sound as of scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous bright, into the cider presses bright, it seemed as if, in a moving away of people from board, leaving a jar of conserve cupboard, and a drawing the corks of train oil flasks, and a breaking the hoops of butter casks, and it seemed as if a voice sweeter far than my harp or my swallery called out, O oh, rats rejoice, the world has grown to a vast dry saltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your lunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just as a bulky sugar punch on, already staved like your great sun shone, grace you scarce an inch before me, just as methought it said, come for me, I found the west are rolling over me. You should have heard the Hamlin people ring the bells so they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, get long poles, poke out the nests and block up the holes. Consult the carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats, when suddenly up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace. The first of you, please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders, the mayor looked blue, so did the corporation too. For council dinners made rare coffee, with clary, moselle, vin, de grave, hop, and half the money would replenish their cellar's biggest butt of Rhenish, to pay the sum to a wondering fellow, with gypsy coat of red and yellow. Besides, quoth the mayor with a knowing wink, our business is done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink, and what's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we are not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink, and a matter of money to put in your poke. But as for the guilders, what we spoke of them, as you well know, was in joke. Besides, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand guilders, come, take fifty. The piper's face fell, and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait inside. I promise to visit by dinner time, Baghdad, and accept the crime of the head cook's potage. All who drink in, for having left in the caliph's kitchen of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I prove no bargain driver. With you don't think I'll bait a stiver. And folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe out for another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I brook, being worse treated than a cook, insulted by a rival with idle pipe and vesture piebald? Threaten us, fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more the piper stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe of smooth gray cane, and ere he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave in rapture there. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling, of merry crowds jostling, a pitching and hustling, small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, and little, little tongues chattering, and like wolves in a farmyard when barley is scattering, out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flax and curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping ran merrily after, the wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood, as if they were changed into blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry, to the children skipping by, could only follow with an eye that joyous crowd and the piper's back, and how the mayor was on the rack, and the wretched council's bosom feet, as the piper turned from the high street to where the west rolled its waters, right in the way of his sons and daughters. How he turned from south to west, and to Copperberg Hill his steps addressed, and after him the children pressed. Great was the joy in every breast. He never can cross the mighty top, he's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed. The piper advanced and the children followed, and when all were in to the very last, the door of the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all? Oh, no, one was lame, and could not dance the whole way. And in after years, if you would blame the sadness, he was used to say, it's dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that I'm the rep of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me. For he led us, he said, to a joyous land, opening the town in jest at hand. The waters gushed and fruit 
flowers before fairer hue, and everything was strange and new. The sparrow was brighter than the peacock here, and their dogs that ran their fellow deer, and honeybees had lost their stings, and horses were born with eagles' wings. And just as I became assured, my lame foot would be speedily cured. The music stopped and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left behind against my will, to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas, for Hamelin, there came to many a burger's pate a text which says at heaven's gate, Opes to the rich it has easy rate, as the needle's eye takes a camel in. The mare sent east, west, north, and south to offer the piper by word of mouth, wherever was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content, to hope he would return the way he went and bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was lost endeavor, the piper and dancers were gone forever. It made a decree that lawyers never to think their records gave it duly, if after the day of the month and year, these words do not as well appear. And so long after what happened here, on the 22nd of July, 1376, with a better memory to fix, the place of the children's last retreat, we called it Pie Piper Street, where anyone played Pike or Tabor was sure for his future to lose his labor, nor suffered the hospital or your tavern to shock with mirth the streets so solemn. And opposite the place of the cavern, they wrote the story on a column, and on a great church window painted, saying to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away. And there it stands this very day. And I must not omit to say that in Transylvania's, that in Transylvania there's a tribe of alien people who ascribe the way and dress of which their neighbors laid such stress to their fathers and mothers, having risen out of some subterranean prison into which they were trepanned long time ago in a mighty band, out of Hamlin Town in Brunswick land, but how or why they don't understand. That is the poem by Robert Browning, Pied Piper of Hamelin. Robert Browning was a Victorian poet, so I'm not exactly sure the date that that poem was written, but more than 100 years ago. I should look that up, actually. Like I said uh, when I was in my introduction, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the rats and some of the characteristics and some of the analogies that we can draw between the ways that the rats are manipulated by the, the Pied Piper's music to the way to Plato's discussion about art, uh, about art and and. Uh, some, some of the dangers that he uh, identifies in the Republic. Some of the things that he feels are dangerous about art. And, uh, so, the first thing, one of the things I was talking about yesterday was that uh, Plato felt that Life imitates art, and I think that that, that idea is especially important now, especially with especially with the rise of um, technologies like virtual like virtual reality and augmented reality. We're going to find that life and art. The the, the, um, the differentiation between those two things is to become less and less. Martin. Le 
life are going to be more inextricably linked. I mean, look at it already. We're already. Everybody's life is. No, I think that we really underestimate the impact that art and culture has on the way that we interact with each other, the choices we make. arguing here that we should take, we should look at the, the Pied Piper's power as, as we, we should, obviously shouldn't read that as being literal, but I think that there's something, you know, the, his magical power is obviously, uh, is obviously an exaggeration, it's a metaphorical hyperbole. saying something, right? It's saying that, you know, art, art does, is powerful. Art and culture is a powerful human construct. And it does have a magical persuasive power in, in a lot of ways. It, it might not be as directly as powerful as the poem suggests. Obviously, Obviously the poem the poem is a good example of magical realism. But there's purpose in the, in the exaggeration of the poem. They you know there is a, there is something to be said about the power that art and culture has over um, how, it, how it shapes human behavior and thought. It's an exceptionally persuasive medium. When I say art, I include poetry, music, dramatic art, music literary art
Okay, now back to the rats. somebody tells that they actually believe. So a liar that believes the lie that he's telling is called the true lie according to the terminology that um, Plato coined. And I think that's, I think we, Robert Browning is, has given a concrete narrative that demonstrates that concept. And it's, it's quite apparent when we look at, the, at how the rats are manipulated by the music. And the, they, they're not just hallucinating what they see, they actually believe what they see is real. So they're, they're being manipulated by their own desires, their own they're telling themselves a lie that they believe. And that was one of the dangers that music, that, that uh, Plato feared when, when we imitate, when we imitate art in our lives. Plato was, was very fearful, very uh, anxious about the role that art played in uh, shaping the consciousness and behaviors of citizens. Marxist term, uh, I think that uh, Plato, we, we could almost say that Plato felt that music produced a false consciousness. That, that the music that the, the Pied Piper plays creates a false consciousness in the and it, which leads the rats to behave in a particular way. It's interesting to compare this, the, 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 the way that the, the rat's behavior is um, described is actually interesting because there's actually parasites that do the same thing to rats. It's, I think it's called uh, tox, toxoplasmosis gondii. And it, it's actually, it makes rats seek out cat urine. And uh, so it's an interesting to think about that parallel, if, like that, that, that idea that maybe the music of the Pied Piper actually has uh, a biological analogy. In the form of a parasite. We should call the taxo, toxoplasmosis gondii parasite, we should call it the Pied Piper, by, uh, what is it? It's a virus, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's the Pied Piper virus. It leads rats to their death. But anyways, yeah, so rats, the rats represent um, the rats represent 
represent what is the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario in a democracy that permits regulated artistic creation. So a system where there's no censorship. The kind of censorship that Plato tries to imagine in the Republic. He, he tries to, you know, prescribe Certain art, certain art would be permitted in the Republic, and some art would be prohibited. So the rats of Hamlin Town, I, I, we shouldn't look at them just as being literal rats, obviously. They are for one thing, they've been at the you know, Robert Browning doesn't want us to think of them as just being rats, because he he anthropomorphizes the rats in in part of the poem where he actually has a rat speaking to us. In fact, that would, we, we need a rat, we need a rat to, to, to actually narrate part of the story to us, otherwise we wouldn't know what happened to the rats and why, the, you know, what happened in the brains of the rats to lure them into, to their death. So we, we need that, in, in the narrative, we need to have that rat speaking to us in order to know the nature of their delusion. And that, that's the reason why it's included in the poem. It has a, a very important structural purpose. Rats represent the worst case scenario of a citizenry that is being manipulated by true, true lies. So true lies are, are lies that um, are told by people that believe what they're saying. So, and a modern parallel of, of all this is obviously fake news. Fake news is something that um, you know. The people that disseminate fake news know it's fake, but they also know that some people are going to believe that they're going to believe 
the stories that they're telling, right? They, those, there's some people out there that will believe um, that are already convinced of the truth of some of the things that the fake news reports on, and. So I'm just going to recite that that uh, that stanza, the one where the rats are lured. Actually, I'll start where I just want to describe the rats to you again. Like the the, the second stanza really describes the chaos and disorderliness that the rats create, the damage they cause to. Um, to their human counterparts, their human. Anyway, so yeah, the, the, uh, I'll just read, I'm just gonna recite the, the second stanza. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles and ate the cheeses from the vats and licked the soup from the cooks on ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests in the men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in 50 different sharps and flats. So we see that the rats are killing their pet, killing, killing the Hamlin, uh, killing the animals of Hamlin, the, the pets of the, sorry. They're killing the pets of Hamlin, they're eating the food, they're uh, spoiling, um, you know, they're causing spoilage and waste. They're nibbling on their, on the toes and the, the limbs of their, of the Hamlin people's children. They're interrupting their worship. And they're disrupting conversations. So we see that the rats are very damaging to society. So I want to say a little bit more about, before I, I recite the next stanza of interest, I want to just sort of, I think somebody's here. No, nobody's here. So, Plato was really worried that Life imitates art. It's not the other way around. Art doesn't imitate, you know, art may imitate life at first, but eventually there's some kind of super. Anyways, yeah, so he felt that he worried that citizens would imitate the bad behavior of. That is, that is being dramatically enacted on stage and in poetry. We 
see this in how the rats are manipulated. The rats, the, the musician, the Pied Piper plays a song that, that the, the rats imitate in their behavior. So the Pied Piper plays a song that is high-pitched and shrill, and the, the, the rats immediately respond in kind. So they, they imitate they imitate the sound, their behaviors imitate the sound that the Pied Piper's pipe produces. So they, the Pied Piper produces a, a high pitched He makes, a, he makes, he plays three shrill notes that sound like a muttering, they sound like grumbling, they sound like a mighty rumbling. And then the rats immediately imitate that, the sound that they hear. So I'm just going to recite that whole stanza. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Like a musical adept, blow his pipe his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, he heard as if an army muttered, and a muttering grew to a grumbling, and a grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling, great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, Brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old fodders, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, all of the Pied Piper for their lives. From street to street he piped advancing, step to step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Wester, wherein all punished and perished, save one who stout as Julius Caesar. As he the manuscript he cherished, to rat land home his commentary, which was, at first shrill notes of the pipe, I heard a sound as of scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous ripe into the cider presses pipe. And it seemed as if a voice sweeter far than my harp or by solary is breathed, called, oh, oh, rats rejoice, the world's grown to a vast dry saltery. So lunch on, crunch on, take your nunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just as a bulky sugar punch on, Already stayed like a great shot. Gracious scarce an inch before me, just as methought it said come for me. I found the Wesser rolling over me. They're imitating they're imitating the art they're imitating the, the music the, 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 uh, that the Pied Piper plays for them
contrast that to the music that the, that the Piper plays for the children. The music that the, the Piper plays for the children is described as being sweet and, and rapturous. It's like a, a rustling that seemed like a bustling. So in, like the, the behaviors of the children mimic the art, the, the music that the Pied Piper plays. The same way that the, the rat's behavior mimics the music that the Piper plays for them. And this is a this is an analogy for how Plato saw the the influence of art on um, the, the lives of citizens. Well, we have to remember that this is not happening. Hamlin is not Plato's Republic. Hamlin is a is a demo, is a democracy. Which would have been very, very important to Robert Browning because he would have been in a generation where democracy would have been just emerging in British society. So he would have been he would have been very interested in the, the concept of art and the influence art has on democratic citizens. So that that's what Robert Browning is doing in this poem. Is he tra he's trying to understand um, what what is what are some of the um, what are some of the effects? What are some of the harms? What are some of the benefits of having artists that have the democratic liberty to create? It is you know without prohibition. critical of Plato in, you know, Plato's project, the, Rep the Republic is, you know, I think it's, in a lot of ways, it's right to say that Plato's Republic is a proto-fascist state. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say that Plato was a fascist, because obviously, were to not be coined um, in his time, and I quite admire Plato's. I quite admire Plato's writing, and his thinking is exceptional. So I'm not saying he's passion, but I think the Republic, in a lot of ways, represents that that possibility. Just a, a fantasy, you know. It's, it's a, it's still a tyranny, but it's a, it's a tyranny ruled by a philosopher king, and supposedly. in the best interest of everyone because he's some kind of philosopher god or something. I don't know. You gotta remember that Plato was writing near the end of Greek Greek civilization. So he would have been very, very concerned with how um, how to how how is how is it best 
what, what's the best what, it, um, what's the best form of government? What what's the most stable form of governance? And I think I think that's the project of Plato's Republic. There is he's he's really just trying to uh, stimulate a conversation about within his own civilization. So it's obviously it's unfair to call Plato a fascist because, for one thing, the word hasn't hadn't been, even been invent, being invented in his time. Fascist, the word fascist is a very very new word, very new coinage, neologism. So in the poem, the, the, both the children and the rats they imitate their behavior mimics their their behavior mimics the the um, the quality quality of the music that the, uh, the Pied Piper produces. I think that Plato's concept of a true lie is more important now, t today, than it's a, it's a concept that needs to be revisited. 
I've been thinking about it a lot because I've been thinking, um, you know, I've been trying to analyze and understand the phenomenon of fake news. I think that Plato's true lie is something that describes the mentality that is that, per, that is able to believe that kind of um, misinformation. Get the, it, in reading the Red Republic, you get the sense that Plato's really concerned about misre the misrepresentation of the misrepresentation of reality in a lot of ways. Like he he wanted he wanted art to be an accurate rep reflection of of life. He didn't he he really. Uh, he really felt that it was dangerous the way that um, that artistic representation can really misrepresent the truth, as he felt. So I think that the poem, the poem envisions two different outcomes for art in a democracy, and it's both seem to be, you know, Robert Browning seems to be fairly ambivalent. I don't, I'm not sure exactly if he's entirely. Um, he's, he's responding. He's reacting to. Plato's texts. And I, I think he's fairly critical of Plato's text, but at the same time he's he's obviously a, gr a great admirer. admirer. So I'm coming to the end of my stream. I'm going to probably shut it down pretty soon here. So I'm just going to try to summarize some of the ideas that I came up with today. 
um, or that I was discussing today. And uh, the, the main, the main, like, the main, uh, the main concept I've been interested in is the, uh, the idea that Plato, you know, the reason Plato was really worried about art was that he felt that life imitates art. And uh, that if, if our art has representations of bad behavior, that, that, that the people that consume that art are going to begin to uh, behave badly or have um, false impressions of the world. Inaccurate in its representation of, of life, and, th and he worried that that misrepresentation would lead lead to misconduct. And we and, he, and the Pied Piper tries to address that in two different ways. One by um, showing. The, making an analogy to the rats, you know, uh, you know, making an analogy between democratic participation and rat, the rats, and then, or uh, you know, citizens within a democracy, they can either end up being rats or they can either be end up being abducted, deluded children that are seeking out some kind of utopian bliss, or or they can end up like the rats, which consume their ways, consume their consume themselves into a dystopia. So there's two, there seems to be two contradictory paths, or, uh, you know, they're not contradictory, but they're dissimilar in some ways. So we felt that art within a democracy can either lead us to delusion, delusions of utopia or delusions of, uh, or, or nightmare of dystopia. And the only solution he gives us is that we need to, like the children, they, they end up being refugees in another, another country. They become citizens of Transylvania. He's almost suggesting that the only way to escape the predicament of democracy is to set up another, a new state, perhaps. I don't know. I'm not sure what he's suggesting as a, as a resolution to the as a resolution to the crisis that the poem presents to us. So I'm just going to recite the poem again. This is. Pied Piper of Hamlin uh, by Robert Browning. And I'm doing this just because um, it's good practice and it uh, keeps my brain, my brain going in the morning. Here it goes. And after, once I'm done the poem, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to say farewell and I uh, hope you have a great day. Anyways. Hamlin Towns in Brunswick, by famous Hanover City, the river Wesser deep and wide washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter spot you never spied, but when begins my pity, almost five hundred years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and fit the cats, and bit the babies in the cradles, 
and ate the cheeses from the vats, and licked the soup from the cooks with the ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests in the men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking, shrieking, and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last, people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mare is the naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking, to think we buy gowns lined with vermin, for dolts who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope you can your old and obese to find in the furry civic roads ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking, to find the remedy we are lacking, or sure as fate will send you packing. At this, the mayor and corporation quaked with a mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council. At length, the mayor broke silence. For a gilder, I'd my vermin gown south. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my forehead aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just as I said, this what should have at the chamber door, but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor. What's that? With the corporation as he sat looking little to wonder at that, nor brighter were his eyes, nor moister than a too long open oyster, save when at him his paunch grew muses, for a plate of trivial green and glutinous, only a scraping of shoes on a mat, anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart will hit a pad. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His long clear coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin and light loose hair and swarthy skin, nor cuff of hair on cheek nor beard on chin. While lips were smile when out and in, there was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's as my great grandson, starting up at the trump of doom's tone, had walked this way from his painted tombstone. He advanced towards the council table, and please, your honor, said he, I was able, by means of secret charm, to draw all the creatures living beneath the sun, that crawl or swim or fly or run, after me so as you never saw. And I chiefly used my charm, all creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper, and people call me the Pied Piper. And here they notice round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe, to match with his coat of self same check. And at scarf's end hung a pipe, and his fingers they notice were ever strained, as if impatient to be played upon this pipe, as low it dangled over his vesture, so old fangled. Yes, said he, Pied Piper as I am, in Tartari I tread the camp, last June from his huge swarms of gnats. I eased in Asia the Nizam, of a monster's brood of vampire bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I rid your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One, fifty thousand was the exclamation of an astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe a while. Like a musical adept to blow his pipe, his lips he wrinkled, the green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled, and ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered, you heard as if an army muttered, and a muttering grew to a grumbling, and a grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling, great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, Grave old plotters, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the Pied Piper for their lives. From street to street he piped, street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Wester, wherein all plunged and perished, save one who stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he the manuscript he cherished, to rat land home his commentary, which was, at first shrill notes of the pipe, I heard a sound as of scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous ripe into the cider presses bright, and it seemed as if a voice sweeter far than by harp or by solary and breed, called out, oh, rats rejoice, the world is grown to a vast gray sultry, so munch on, crunch on, take your nunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just the bulky sugar punch on, already stayed like the great sun shone, gracious scarce an inch before me, just as we thought it said come for me, I felt the western rolling over me. You should have heard the hands of people ring the bells till they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, get along the poles, poke out the nests and block up the holes. Consult with carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats. When suddenly up the face of the pipe of turf in the marketplace, with the first, if you please, my thousand guilders. 
A thousand guilders. The mayor looked blue, so did the corporation too. For council dinners they were having, with Clary and Moselle bidding to grub hawk, and half the money would replenish their cellar's biggest butt of reddish, to pay this sum to a wondering fellow, with gypsy coat of red and yellow. Besides, quoth the mayor, the knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink, and what's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we are not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink, and a matter of money to put in your poke. But as to the yogurt, what we spoke of them, as you well know, was a joke. Besides, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand guilders, come, take fifty. The piper's face fell and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait beside. I promise to visit by dinner time, Baghdad. They set the front of the head of Cook's clock lodge, all he's rich in, for having left in the killer's kitchen of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I proved no bargain driver, which you don't think no bait to stiver. And folks who put me in a passion, they finally pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I brook? Being worth treated then a cup, insulted by a rival, with idle pipe and vesture piebald. Threaten us, fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe of smooth straight cane. And ere he blew three notes, such sweet, soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling, a very crowd jostling and pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, and little tongues chattering. And like falls in the farmyard and barley is scattering, out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flax and curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping run merrily after. The wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood, as if they were changing blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry, to the children merrily skipping by, who could only follow with an eye that joyous crowd at the piper's back, and how the mayor was on the rack, and the wretched council's bosom feet, as the piper turned from the high street, to where the lesser rolled and wanders, right in the way of their sons and daughters. How he turned from south to west, and to Copperbrook Hill with the steps addressed. And after him the children pressed, for great was the joy in every breast. He never crossed the mighty top, he's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see 